Hello and welcome to The Business Interview. I'm Stephen Carroll. My guest today has been associated with some of the biggest brands in the world. He's been president of PepsiCo and the chief executive of Apple. Now he's set to go into competition with his former colleagues with the launch of his own range of low-cost smartphones. John Scully joins us from the Web Summit in Dublin, an event that brings together technology executives, startups and investors. John Scully, thank you for joining us from Dublin. Uh, I think you probably fit into all of those categories at one stage or another in your career. But let's talk about this newest venture of yours. It's a smartphone uh, being launched with OB Mobiles. Are you trying to remake the iPhone? We're really inspired by the tremendous success that Apple has had with the iPhone, but Apple uh, is really not a competitor to us or we to them. Uh, what has happened is that technology is so commoditized that it's now possible to build a high-quality smartphone uh, where we can differentiate with great design. I brought together the head of Apple's product design when I was there, Robert Bruner, who originally hired Johnny Ives, uh, the former chief marketing officer of Apple when I was there, Sajiv Chahil. And we are designing in Silicon Valley uh, a design for technology that's commoditized where we can sell at price points way below anything Apple would ever be interested in. And we can appeal to the emerging markets. We'll never have much interest to sell in uh, most of Europe or in the United States because these are replacement markets with strong uh, competition. But we're focused on the emerging markets, uh, markets where we have already a billion dollar supply chain and IT distribution business. So we have some familiarity with the sales channels. And we believe that we can uh, reach out to first first-time buyers uh, who may have the aspiration for these higher price products, but they don't have the personal budget. And so uh, we've launched in uh, South Asia. We're rolling out into Africa, into Latin America. We'll go into some CIS countries as well. And by the middle of next year, uh, we should have uh, all of our uh, products and distribution channels pretty well aligned. Well, I mean, you're going to be competing with uh, the, the Chinese manufacturers mainly in that lower end of the, the low-cost uh, market for smartphones. Will you be able to uh, beat them with your know-how from your time and previous experience? Uh, I don't think we uh, approach it from the standpoint of... Uh, can we beat them? I think there are already some incredibly successful companies. Xiaomi would be a good example of that. Huawei's done extremely well. Um, so we wouldn't be interested in doing this, Stephen, if uh, we weren't moving into a market that is uh, going through exceptionally high growth. Uh, if you're going into a market where you have to take your business away from a competitor, that's really hard. Uh, and especially with great uh, competitors uh, like some of the Chinese companies. But if you're going into a market which is uh, growing at incredible rate of growth, as we're seeing in the emerging markets, and where you've got new young consumers coming in uh, who are looking for products that uh, can have aspirational design to them, but at attractive price points, we don't need to get a very big market share in order to be able to build a, a very attractive business for ourselves. Remember, we're a private company, we're not a public company, and so our ambitions uh, may be quite different than some of the large public companies. Well, I suppose not yet, you're not a public company. If it goes well, it could go down that road. Uh, let's talk, you talked about some of your former colleagues that you've brought with you uh, from Apple. It's a company you spent 10 years at the head of. Do you recognize Apple when you look at it today? Well, I certainly recognize uh, what Steve Jobs uh, taught me when he and I first worked together, because those same principles are very much in place at Apple today. I think the leadership uh, that's running Apple is outstanding. I think Tim Cook is doing a really terrific job of uh, continuing the legacy of Steve Jobs. And I believe that the iPhone 6 um, has at least a, two years or more of great uh, prosperity because there's such a large install base of loyal Apple users who will want to upgrade. Well, of course, the, the, a lot of investor had, investors had been worrying about the new product line coming uh, from Apple. What do you make of their newer products, the Apple Watch? Think it's something that's going to work? I really don't have much to say about the Apple Watch because the product is not yet on the market. I haven't seen a prototype of it. Um, I think I'll sort of say I'll wait and see. And, and uh, I know Apple can design beautiful products. That's not the issue. The issue is whether uh, there really is a market for uh, a spectacular designed watch. And we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, the, the iPhone is a lot easier to understand because the product already you know, has established itself and Apple is particularly unique at being able to 
uh, balance between beautiful fashion design, make technology beautiful, or make it invisible. No one does it better than Apple. And if you if you were still in charge there, would you be making different decisions very different from what they're making now? Well, I don't think uh, uh, there's anything I could add to what they're doing. I think uh, they're doing a, an exceptional job. And uh, in our own case with uh, OB Mobile, uh, we'll just have to see how well uh, we can we can do. Uh, but we're we're not even focused on uh, competing with Apple. We're we're in a very different um, line of business and what what Apple is interested in. Uh, Apple is really the high end premium product, um, and and we're not trying to position OB as a high end premium product. We're saying we can do great design. Uh, Silicon Valley quality design, but uh, we're, we're going to do it at, at very different price points than uh, Apple would focus at. While you were the head of that company, was during the period that it was setting up a big base there in Ireland where you are, uh, do you think the tax changes coming to Ireland are going to change uh, Apple and other technology companies' positions in Ireland? Well, I've been involved with Ireland for quite some time. Even before I joined Apple, uh, I was involved with helping set up uh, Pepsi's uh, as the first international company to uh, locate an operation in Ireland. And then Apple was the first high-tech company when I joined Apple to uh, locate an operation in Apple. So I've had a, a long uh, history of experience uh, working with the IDA, the Irish Development Authority. It's, it's a great group. They're very talented. Uh, uh, obviously, the tax incentives have been attractive. Uh, I was involved with uh, both Pepsi and Apple in, in uh, some of those negotiations. Uh, there is this issue now, what's called the double Irish, uh, in terms of how intellectual property is uh, you know, given a pass from a tax standpoint. And there's obviously some resentment in the rest of the EU, and, and particularly in the U.S., uh, with this issue of what's called inversion, uh, where the taxes in the U.S., as you know, are the highest corporate taxes in the world. We actually collect all the taxes, and we uh, tax people for overseas income uh, if, tax, if cash is brought back in. Uh, I think that the U.S. Uh, is going to have to put on their agenda now with the new elections behind them on uh, rethinking and hopefully revising the tax code, and um, maybe that'll have some uh, offset that uh, the U.S. companies that locate in places like Ireland won't be so dependent on those as alternatives. But we'll just have to wait and see. I think Ireland is, is, is not going to uh, change any more than it has to in terms of uh, giving some tax advantage for international companies like Apple and others. Do you think it's really likely that the American authorities would change the tax code? Are they that worried about companies fleeing the country? Well, I, I think they are worried about uh, companies fleeing the country, and, and that's one of the reasons why inversion, which means uh, uh, have a foreign company buy a U.S. company so that you can go to the lower taxes of what that international company is paying versus the extraordinarily high taxes for corporations in, in the U.S. But I'm speculating that uh, in this last two years of the Obama administration, uh, that if he wants to have a legacy for his presidency, there's not much to show unless he can uh, get the Congress, now controlled by the Republicans, to negotiate on things which they have interest in, and they have a lot of interest to revise the tax code. And I think that uh, we may actually be surprised and see that the administration and the Congress may actually find something to agree on, and hopefully it would be uh, things like uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and the Transatlantic Partnership on uh, trade agreements, which have been stalled, uh, things like the ability for the uh, tax code to be revised uh, with some compromises on, on both sides, Congress and the administration, and even things like uh, allowing the U.S. to export oil now that uh, the U.S. has become a, a major oil um, developer. Uh, you know, far beyond anything people could have speculated on a few years ago. OK, let's talk about you're there at the Dublin Web Summit, surrounded by a lot of new technology companies and startups. Uh, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a new venture? Has anything caught your eye while you're there? Well, I don't need a new, a new venture. I've got about uh, you know, 15 or 16 companies that I'm already in invested in and very active uh, in. But what really is impressive to me is that everything we hear about the EU is how it's in falling back into further recession and how its future is quite dim. And yet, you come to this Web Summit. Four years ago, they had only 400 
uh, people in attendance. This year, there are 26,000 people here at the Web Summit. They are enthusiastic entrepreneurs. They're high-tech people. Um, it's, it's just amazing to me uh, how uh, different this is from what we hear about the EU. And these are all citizens of the EU who are uh, here at this Web Summit. So I think uh, that even when people are uh, somewhat pessimistic on what governments are doing, uh, it's really impressive to see uh, how people are stepping forward, in this case entrepreneurs uh, stepping forward with huge enthusiasm to start new companies right here in the EU. So it's I, really quite positive, and it would be wonderful to see something like this happen on the continent as well, like and, the Web Summit. Are, are, is there anything, you know, looking back at the, your investment decisions in the past few years, is there any company that you wish you'd invested in, say, in the past five years? Oh, sure. I mean, <laughs> there have been uh, so many extraordinary successes um, in, in, in the last five years. Uh, I remember one example, one of my uh, uh, partners, uh, who uh, we co-founded a company called Misfit uh, Wearables, which has been very successful. We're in Silicon Valley, and we're, we have a, about a, uh, 130 employees in Vietnam and in China. And uh, he said that he had met uh, one of the founders of Airbnb back when they were trying to figure out how to start a company. And I said, well, I wish you'd told me about them, because I would have loved to have met them. So you know, there are always opportunities that you miss uh, you know, after the fact. But I don't worry about that, because the opportunity, to, Stephen, to build uh, billion-dollar companies is extraordinary today. Very simply, there's a power shift, and I wrote about it in a book I just recently wrote called Moonshot. There's a power shift in the marketplace where customers are getting more and more control. Customers are paying more attention to what other customers have to say about a product or a service than they are to the traditional messages from large corporations. And what this means is that if you combine this with what's called the network effect, the network effect is the uh, pass along recommendations from one customer to another customer to another customer, which people are doing over mobile devices, which is using data from the, the cloud. Uh, it's enabling companies to go from startup to um, hundreds of millions of customers uh, okay. in a matter of just a few years. We've never had anything like that before. John Scully, former chief executive of Apple, joining us there from the Web Summit. Thank you for your time. And that's it for this edition of the Business Interview. Uh, plenty more news coming up on Franz Vanquet. Stay with us. The Observer's Direct. Goma lies along the eastern border of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's as far from the capital as you can get. In this war-torn and poverty-stricken part of the country, mental disorder has become a major problem. And with so few psychiatrists and no infrastructure to help, the mentally ill are left to fend for themselves. Accompanied by our observer Charlie Casarica, our crew went to Goma to investigate this humanitarian disaster. The Observers Direct on France 24 and France24.com.